So here's a model of three-dimensional structure showing a mix of helical and beta sheet regions. Sometimes we refer to the regions of polypeptide that are neither helical nor pleated as random coil. And this is a single polypeptide in which regions of pleated chains are linked together to form a pleated sheet. And interspersed in this polypeptide are the alpha helical regions. And connecting each one of them so that this is a single contiguous polypeptide are these random coil regions. What causes proteins to fold into their three-dimensional or tertiary structure? Well, largely it's interactions between the side chains of the amino acids, which can be quite distant. Unlike secondary structure, which is the result of nearby amino acid interactions, three-dimensional structure can be the result of interactions of side chains of amino acids that are quite distant from one another. So in this model, the blue cones are the polar side chains. Again, these can be the result of uh, acidic and basic amino acids in the chain, which have positive and negative charges because of the gain or loss of an actual proton. Or they can be the result of partial positive and negative charges on the other kinds of polar amino acid side chains. And the green cones are the nonpolar or hydrophobic side chains. And what happens is that the hydrophobic side chains because they don't interact well with water, will tend to aggregate and tend to be on the inside, the interior core of a folded chain, leaving the surface to have most of the polar side chains and therefore can interact well with water. The formation of three-dimensional structure involves a lot of weak interactions. And here are the kinds of interactions. Ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds can form between opposite charges on either acidic and basic amino acids or on these polar covalent partially charged side chains. They can result from the many hydrophobic interactions, which are actually the result of these things called van der Waals interactions. You may remember from chemistry that van der Waals interactions form when atoms get very close to one another. And that is basically what happens as hydrophobic components of side chains of amino acids get very close to one another in order to thoroughly exclude water molecules with which they cannot interact. All of these interactions individually are very weak. But when you have many of them, the three-dimensional structure of proteins, for example, is in fact very strong. So strength in numbers. We can denature proteins, that is, disrupt those weak bonds. Here is urea denaturing a protein. And by denature, we mean unfold, basically disrupt all of the van der Waals forces, the ionic interactions, the hydrogen bonds that are holding this three-dimensional structure together. If you remove urea, which you can do by the process of dialysis, you can sometimes get back the folded protein you started with. The protein would refold. What really happens when you remove the cause of denaturation, in this case urea, is that the protein will fold to its lowest free energy conformation, which is another way of saying it folds to its most stable state. Sometimes, as I said, this could be the original structure of the polypeptide, the original three-dimensional structure. But in fact, very often, that isn't the case. And we'll see in a moment what I mean by that. OK, all this folding to get secondary structure and then to get three-dimensional structure leads to many different polypeptides with many exquisitely different shapes. And again, the theme here is shape, shape, shape. These are, by the way, computer-generated models intended to show the space occupied by the structures of the polypeptide or polypeptide chains in space. And these are models of real proteins, so you see all the names here, just to give you an idea of the many different shapes that polypeptides can acquire.